maybe you ought to look at a website. So it's probably useful to get a little bit more background than that. Um, so I'll do a little bit of an overview and then Jeff can walk around. We've got a bigger map that you can take a look at. And then I understand you guys had your own community meeting, some of you anyway, had a community meeting yesterday. Uh, so, I mean, the re really this is about getting some input and hearing concerns and just making sure we have all the best information uh, as we're trying to work on design, right? So we have a concept, but you know, we want to really hear from the community. Um, so I, again, I'm Gabe Lajanas. I'm the, the sponsor and the builder and sort of the overseer of this idea. And, um, you know, just in terms of background of how, you know, we got here to this place at this time, you know, we moved to Montpelier about five years ago from Northfield. We were trying to get our son into, you guys have great schools. We have great schools here, right? And so trying to get our son into the high school it worked out really well. He got an appointment to West Point and just finishing his plea bureau. But when we moved here five years ago, we could not find a place to live. We couldn't. And so my admin at the office, she went into the senior center and asked everyone. And I got three leads of potential private sales. And that was how we had to buy our house. There was no way we could have moved here if we didn't have some network. There's just, it wasn't gonna hit the MLS. There was no way. And so, you know, you sort of look at that and you look at where we've, we've gone through it. It was really just so apparent over the last couple of years as I'm hearing stories about, you know, we're, we all hear these stories, right? People that, you know, are commuting in here that want to live here, but can't find a place to rent, can't find a place to live. Um, you know, people that have a place to rent, but want to buy someplace. We just don't have a very healthy uh, ecosystem of housing, right? We've got, we have some great housing, but we don't have a good ecosystem, right? People need to be able to, people that need to rent or want to rent should be able to rent, right? And people that want to be able to get a starter home should be able to get a starter home. And, all the way through that whole cycle, right? People that want to downsize, right? Some people want to downsize. They don't need that big house. So where, where are they going to go? And so just story after story of people that are just having such a hard time. And I think we all realize that there's a housing crisis that's going on and it's impacting a lot of people, uh, including a lot of vulnerable people because there's, there's just no movement, right? People stay, this is part of the issue, right? People are staying in their places because they don't have that downsizable house. So they stay and then nobody has a place to live. And so then they're not moving out of their rental. So nobody can rent, right? It's just really unhealthy. So anyway, uh, as I'm watching all this and you know, being involved in the community and thinking about things, it just seemed like this is, this is a need. And I'm the son of a builder and my brother's a builder. And so I've been in that ecosystem since I was a little kid hauling lumber around a job site. And it's like, well, look, who's gonna fix this if it's not you, right? Who's gonna work on this if it's not you? And, and really, I think the situation we're in, and you guys all know the story of this place better, better than anyone, um, but if you look at what happened after 2008, and really where all the money has gone, so we had a big housing crisis. We had a bubble, we had a housing crisis, and then it's become really institutional money. So if you look at construction all over this country, including single family homes, right? We've got you know Blackstone buying entire housing developments. And, and really there aren't a lot of regional builders anymore. There's custom home builders, right? So if you've got the money and you wanna build your dream home, you can do that. But um, those people are not, those institutional investors are not investing in Northern New England and other rural places, right? They're in, they're in Austin, Texas, and they're in Boise, Idaho. And they're, you know, it's all about a process and a system. And that's just where the money has gone. And, uh, and so again, who are the, the regional builders? So, just feeling that like, hey, you know, you can maybe pull something together and pull some people together. I got started um, in February last year with a new business venture and the first project um, they were just gonna be completing in Montpelier was a triplex. Uh, if you look at, you know, where most municipalities have gone and certainly the city of Montpelier, there's a thought about infill housing, right? How do we keep our, our you know, downtown centers strong and have walkable neighborhoods and those kind of things. And so, you know, I bought a, a lot that had been subdivided and we, you know, we're gonna have three families that have a place to live that didn't before. Um, so we started that and then I did a project with my brother. He's out in the Seacoast, that's nine units. We got the first three and we're kind of working through that. But then it's how do, you do, how do you do something of a grander scale? How do we actually have a neighborhood? How do we create some community? How do we create something beautiful um, and continue you know, some of these other beautiful neighborhoods like yours that we already have? And uh, so I called the city and you know, talked to the, the planning folks and got some ideas. And I think you all know, like most of us know, there are four or five major places where could, there could be development. So I talked to all of those places 
And to be able to do a project like this, it really requires a landowner. I mean, there's a few things. First of all, we're shooting for sort of the missing middle, right? We're, we want to be as affordable as possible. And, you know, one thing that has to happen is you have to have somebody that's willing to sell the land at a, a price that it's, it's going to make sense, you know, to be able to build on. And anyway, it just maybe some of those projects will happen someday. We all hope they do. But the Fectos, as you know, they had the last approved development here, which they basically, after Act 250, that, you know, 2008 happened, and they just put the brakes on it. And ever since then, they've been looking to offload the land. So they were willing to be very patient, right? I mean, you think about all the risk, right? To go and do the engineering and, you know, to get the design done and have all the meetings and the hearings and get something approved. It's in today's environment, it's like 250 to $300,000. And a landowner that's willing to be patient while you take that year to year and a half process, have meetings with the community, have meetings with the city. I mean, it's a significant risk and a significant investment of time. And, you know, the Fectos were willing to give us the time. And so that was sort of the origin about six months ago was that conversation where after a lot of conversations um, that this was a place that it could happen. So then it was, well, how do you make it happen, right? It's, it's a million dollar piece of land. There's, you know, probably whatever you build here, it's multi millions of dollars. And so you have to bring partners in, right? You have to get some people involved. And so I'm really grateful to be partnered with some folks that have some really good background, uh, Karen and Tom Luzon and Barry um, who were involved, and then a, a gentleman, uh, Stu McGowan, who bought a lot of the, uh, you know, really dilapidated, you know, beautiful architecture, but really not very well taken care of homes in the, the old North End in Burlington, and rehabilitated them and really put a shot of energy into that community in Burlington. So I've got some really good partners on, on board, and then my brother, who's been in the industry for 30 <coughs> years, is consulting for us. So that's kind of like how, how we got here. So then it's, well, you know, well, what do you do? We have a team, you know, we've got a site, we have a beautiful neighborhood, you know, what do you do? And there, there's definitely some math involved, right? It's like, well, you know, we don't know, economies can change, you know, we can all look at financial markets and, you know, feel pressure and look at, you know, go to the grocery store and feel pressure, right? We have a lot of inflationary things that are happening. And, uh, and so it's, you know, basically this is a minimalist. It's like, what, what can you do to, at, to at least break even, right? To at least have, have, be able to say this was a profitable venture. We didn't lose our money trying to create housing for people, right? And so I know it's much different than the 215 units that were, you know, considered under the Fectos. It is very, very different. Uh, but it's also, you know, in terms of risk, it's the least risky, right? We can put something in, we can see how it sells, and we can sort of move through it in that way. Um, so anyway, that's that's how we got to where we are. I'm going to have Jeff, you know, walk around, uh, you know, just kind of walk around the map a bit. But I thought it would be useful. I'll just talk about some because I've had some conversations with people in the community, just some of the themes that I'm seeing because there may be things that are on your mind. I mean, I, I think, first of all, we, we know, you know, safety is really paramount, right? You come through here and there's all these, you know, young kids and then there's the young at heart and there's everybody out with their dog. And, you know, this is a really vibrant walkable community and so safety really is very important and it's important to us and we don't want to change that uh, character of the neighborhood in any way uh, it is really interesting you know when you look at we, we picked this design it was it's new in the um, in the regs uh, for montpelier it's they've been built in other places but these cottage clusters they really change the focus you know as you have front doors facing common green spaces and move the parking to the periphery they really change the environment and while they've been around for a long time it was really there's a lot of foresight because you know I, I don't know about you but if you look at your <coughs> mileage on your vehicle the last couple years and you compare it to the couple years before that we're all driving a lot less we're all in our communities a lot more and so making the vehicles less part of you know they're there you know we live in Vermont you know there's a lot of places that we need to get to um, but they're not the, the main focus right and so you know, the idea of having these, these tighter communities uh, important. But, but we want in all of that, you know, to make sure we'll do traffic studies. Uh, if there are things that need to be done around the existing road in terms of visibility, right, we'll work with landowners if we need to, you know, help with some vegetation or something or that we need mirrors, whatever it is that, we, you know, that we need to do to make sure people can see each other, right, and that we're safe and people should be driving slow, right, all those things. So that, that's a concern of ours as well. 
another another common theme uh, that that came up was I don't know it was common, but I had several people, including one very detailed note last night about water. And that's a real issue, right? And so as we work through the permitting process, so VHB, if you don't know, I mean, they're an amazing engineering firm all over the East Coast. They've done developments that you know of. They've done, you know, Stowe Mountain and Queechee, we all know those, but they do developments all over in a very difficult, you know, Vermont, there's a lot of water and there's difficult terrain. And so rest assured, you know, that we will do what is necessary to, to make sure that there's not the, you know, the people that are down hill, right? I mean, they don't want to have flooding. There's some flooding issues downhill. We're aware of that and appreciate the people who uh, were sent us some more information on that. So, you know, the more information we have, the, the better that we can, you know, do what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I've had a couple common questions. I've had some people asking about price points and I would just say, you know, we really, the target market, you know, there's 36 uh, cottages and then there's 16 single family lots and so the cottages you know single family lots those are r9000 so people can buy those and they can build you know what's whatever's available under r9000 rules but the cottages um, are really targeted at you know first time home buyers or people trying to downsize and the reason i'm just hesitant to put price on things is like boy the price of lumber doubled last year on me right like it's back down but things changed right and there's a lot of competition for labor right now you know, so if you get a subcontractor and they come out, they, they may or may not be able to get the workforce that they need to be able to get things done. So, you know, the process of it is we get land use approval. So, you know, we go and we have, you know, an initial sketch hearing. We'll get, you know, get your feedback today. We'll get some feedback from the DRB and then we'll really get to work. Um, if all that permitting, if it all kind of flowed and there weren't a lot of problems, maybe this fall, uh, we have land use approval, which is perfect time to put it out for bid because contractors are slowing down. And then once we have bids in, you know, we'll have a better handle on what the cost might look like. But right now, it's just really, really hard to say. We do hope, you know, like all of us, that inflationary pressures come down. So that's another uh, common question. You know, I think, I think, Jeff, do you want to just, you know, talk about the design sure. for a minute? And then um, we, I, I think you have a couple people that maybe are appointed or something. I'm not sure. We'd love to have feedback. I just, you know, we're, we're not in a public hearing, so there's no two minute rule, but there's a lot of people here. So I would just say, like, just recognize there are a lot of people that want to say things. And, and some of the more technical things, like the note that I got last night, they're actually better to communicate in writing. Like I got, you know, I got some pictures, I got some real, you know, detailed information, and that was, I was able to provide that to my engineer. So just, you know, just be respectful that, you know, we want to make sure everybody that wants to be heard today can be heard. So uh, Jeff, why don't you? Yeah. Walk I'm us around. Jeff Swaver. I'm an engineer with VHB. Um, we have offices in Montpelier and in South Burlington. Um, what is VHB? Uh, at Estee Hagen, Breslin. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, yeah we, we're a civil engineering firm. Uh, we have an environmental group. Uh, we have traffic folks. Um, we have about 1,500 people all up and down the East Coast. We kind of operate as local markets. I pretty much cover Vermont. Like our offices cover Vermont. So we're not, we're not all over the place. We understand the local issues. Um, all my work's exclusively in, in Vermont, but we still have those resources. There's some technical things that, you know, you're, they're one-offs, and, and so we can reach outside of Vermont and, and get that input. Um, and so, Gabe, um, you know, last um, fall uh, reached out to us and brought us on board uh, to do the site lay layout and eventually the civil engineering. So we're kind of taking that in phases. Um, and one of the things that we considered, you know, it's, it's a large parcel. 72 acres. Uh, there's some areas of it further down that have some steep slopes, but there's some great areas, you know, up top here. Um, it's located near um, a lot of your neighborhood. And so we try to figure out, um, you know, how, how can we best use that land? And, you know, the traditional way would be to kind of just pick one density and lay out lots all throughout. And, and that cover, you know, steep slopes, um, you know, areas that are great to develop on, areas that are not great to develop on. But we're, we're trying to make sure that we put that growth where um, where it best works for both the parcel, the topography of the parcel, the natural resources of the parcel, um, and then for the butters. So um, to, to try to do that, we really have two, as Gabe mentioned, you know, two, two products. The single family home lots that will be along this area here um, and around the perimeter of the site, uh, which very closely replicate the density um, and the style 
uh, of lighter homes. Um, and then clustered in the middle um, are all the, the cottage homes. And so those ha have, um, it's just the house and they're located around um, a green. So like a shared open space, uh, you know, more of the, the sense of community. Uh, with garages like a shared garage, so um, it'll be a row of you know not not a not a parking garage, but you know just a row of um, parking spaces that'll be covered in the winter. You don't have to, to, to um, scrape up your car every every, uh, every morning, um, and then walking along a short sidewalk um, to, to, to the cottage homes that are grouped in. I think it's 10, 10 clusters throughout the neighborhood, and and that's a little denser development than than um, your homes, but it allows us to kind of preserve a lot of that 72 acres um, and keep it open um, for recreation and people to, to use and to protect the natural resources there. Um, and, and so along the, the south end of the parcel um, is where there's the existing deeded recreation land and then the portion of it that will remain undeveloped. And so, um, you know, it, it, it'll kind of integrate into one community. The, the, this um, newer portion in your um, community along Isabel Circle. It'll just be an extension in the circle um, and allow uh, people to walk along the sidewalks um, if they want to um, along the road. It's a low volume road. You know, we all know that the sidewalks don't get plowed right away. Um, and we feel that for th this number um, of cars, um, it's, it's safe to walk along the road as long as people um, have adequate sight distances, right? If, if you can see the car coming, the car can see you com coming. We live in Vermont, people drive courteous. Um, this is going to be the, um, the only entrance and exit to this neighborhood, right? It's not going to be a cut through street. People aren't going to be in a hurry um, to, to be on the highway down uh, to the south and cut through um, and keep going on the north side of the parcel. So we think that you know, this development will really be integrated and become almost one and the same um, with you. Um, and, and it's well under um, you know, 500 trips a day where you start transitioning that guidance, right? You're, you're, gonna only, you're not going to expect two um, you're not going to expect at the same spot a uh, pedestrian, uh, a car going each way, um, where that the cars can't move over. So um, we want to make sure that um, it's safe. You, you have, it both has to be, be safe and you have to feel safe, right? Like if it, you can't have just one or the other. Um, so in this neighborhood, there would be good sight lines along the, um, uh, along the um, streets. Um, and in an existing neighborhood, we want to make sure, um, you know, from what I've seen, most of it is, is perfectly adequate. I, there is a few areas where there's some brush in, in the right of way and, and some, some corners, and we want to enhance those, those sight distances um, to the extent we can to, to make sure that, that people that are walking along um, with, with, with the traffic um, feel safe as well. Um, so, so that's kind of how we came up with the layout um, and the traffic. Um, we also, um, you know, in engineering, we'll have to, to cover um, utilities. Um, it's served by um, municipal water, municipal sewer, um, so there's not going to be large leach fields, there's not going to be um, a bunch of wells. Um, and so that makes it, you know, a great track of land for, for development opportunities, right? We're not, we're not, we're not tearing up environment to, um, to construct large leach fields um, and, and drilling, um, you know, deep bedrock wells for, for each individual home. Um, Stormwater. Uh, the state of Vermont has um, six treatment standards that are required. Uh, water quality, channel protection, groundwater recharge, um, soil depth and quality, uh, or <coughs> overbank, um, overbank uh, control, and extreme flood prevention. So each of those uh, covers you know, small events and large events. Um, historically, you know, in the 70s certainly, and going into the 80s and early 90s, um, you know, Engineers typically designed for large storm events. They're like, you know, if, if, if the water comes down, you know, 50 year event, 100 year event, you know, an event that happens once every 50 or 100 years, how do we hold that water back? But what we didn't realize is, um, or maybe we did, we just weren't think smart about it, um, that 90% of your storm events are less than one inch. So those smaller events, the water quality event, we're gonna capture that water, um, provide treatment, phosphorus reduction, uh, and make sure that water discharges at a slower rate. So um, through those five standards that the state um, has adopted, there's a you know, large spectrum um, of, of events that we need to consider. Um, what we also heard and, and what's typical you know, of, of, of steep uh, slopes is um, you know, they're concerned about you know, where is the water going? Where is it coming from? 
So not only do we need to meet those, those six standards, uh, we need to look you know, downhill at, at each point and figure out what, how much water came um, before the development and how much water um, is coming after the development and, and the quantities and the rates and the flows and, and make sure that we don't adversely ad affect the downstream development. Um, and, and the goal isn't, you know, the status quo, not to, we, we want to, we feel that, you know, by, by looking at and hearing your concerns, um, you know, we can look at a map and see what it is, um, but we don't necessarily, um, you know, without reaching out to the neighbors, we, we don't necessarily understand, you know, some of the nuances there. So that's, um, I really appreciate Gabe um, reaching out to the neighborhood and setting up these meetings so you can hear, you know, the specific challenges um, and the, the needs that, you know, where we can address deficient conditions um, if possible. So, so, so the goal is the status quo, and the, you know, our, our goal is to, to try to improve things. Um, and, and I feel like we can by looking at those, um, you know, state standards and then also, you know, general good design practices um, beyond that. Um, during construction, you know, the, the operational six standards, that, that's for long term, that's, that's basically forever measures. Um, we also want to be good stewards of the land during construction. Uh, it will require a state stormwater permit, um, and we're going to have to make sure that we're, we're smart about it, um, and we'll have to come up with a phasing plan so that um, no longer do you see like a large development in all 20 acres um, that'll be developed out of that 72 acres, um, you know, open and denuded. Um, it'll strategically going through and minimizing the durations um, of disturbance and making sure that we, we get those soils vegetated as soon as possible. Um, and once you, know, you break it down in small chunks and you do it smartly um, and you communicate with the contractor, with um, the builder, uh, with the engineer, um, erosion and a lot of the, the, the struggles that we're struggling with in Vermont um, are, are, are quite manageable. Um, and we've had success um, in many areas. Um, th this does have some steeper land, but um, you know, VHB, we do at all of the major ski resorts, we, we do um, design and engineering for their ski trails um, and, and getting it vegetated. Um, and doing it smart, um, we feel that the, the steep slopes um, are not um, something that's adverse to this, this uh, proposed project at all. Um, yeah, I, I, this is, um, you know, the two years, it's, it's great to see you guys out here. Um, I, I, please, you know, feel free to give your comments now, um, but feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, I, I want to hear it. Um, I want to get your input. Um, it's, um, I've been, for two years I've been doing Zoom meetings and pre presenting um, on Zoom meetings and it's just not, you don't get the same feedback. Um, you can convey the information, but uh, please feel free to, to either um, let us know now, you know, in a, in a public setting, uh, your, what your concerns are um, and, and don't hesitate to come up with me, come up to me one-on-one -on -one or, or give me a call after the meeting. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to see what, you know, what some of the nuances and, and the concerns of, your, of neighborhood, the neighborhood is. So did you have something you wanted to say right at the beginning before we sure, kind of open so, it up? Sure, um, so hi everyone, I'm Christopher Viersma. I live at Four Isabel Circle in the Wild Garden House. Um, <laughs> so a bunch of us neighbors gathered here last night and just wanted to kind of like get an idea um, what was going on and then we, you know, looking forward to having you here. So. We did go around and gather, you know, some of the things that we were thinking about the most. And I would say it kind of came down to uh, number one, we, uh, and I'm not speaking for everyone, of course, um, we think that, you know, the road, there should be another road. We'd like to see you hear, hear you talk to that. Um, you know, there's a lot of kids that live on this road. It's a very quiet road and, you know, seeing a hundred more cars every day back and forth you know this is a, a neighborhood that is out of the way from downtown people do have to commute in vermont <coughs> everywhere so we imagine there's going to be a lot of cars a lot of construction and traffic so that's kind of the number one thing that everyone was thinking about you know number two is we've all been in vermont more or less uh for a while now and i think you know one of the great things about here is that we are concerned with affordability you know we're uh folks are you're right like that you know there is a a, a missing middle um, and I think that that middle is, is larger than maybe what uh, you spoke to. So I think that, you know, kind of expanding on that, we'd like to see that there are opportunities for, uh, you know, low to middle income to working class folks that, that do want to buy their first home that, um, yeah. So, you know, that is a big issue, affordability in Vermont. 
Um, and then of course, you know, we are privileged. We've been uh, enjoying this this beautiful uh, piece of nature here, and you know, we're concerned that that's going away. So um, yeah, and I and I definitely want to hear from everyone else. So um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Can I say something? Yes, I have please, a limited sir. amount of time. Yes, sir. Oh. Thank you. You're the only one with a limited amount of time, Howard. <laughs> well, you know something. You got to grab it when you get a chance. Yeah, and you're good at that. Barbara, are you all done? Not yet, but you go right ahead, since you have a limited <laughs> amount of time. Hi, my name's Howard Coffin. I've uh, lived here 25 years in Stonewall condos. Uh, I'm a seventh generation Vermonter. There's one word that uh, defines my feeling about this, and that is no. <laughs> what on earth are we looking at here? We have about as close to paradise as you can come in this world. We have some of the best of Vermont right here, and some of the best of Vermont is some of the best of anything. And we're sitting here hearing that they have come here to solve the housing crisis. That is not true. They have come here to make money. And they're going to spend as little as possible and charge as much as they can and make as much as they can and leave us with the results. More traffic. There will be more pollution. They cannot plan you cannot plan for what storms are going to be because we are in climate change. You have no idea. This is our park. We live here, we have our park. The, the city is divided by a river. On the north side, they have Hubbard Park. They just added to it. We have nothing over here but this. If you want to do us a favor, buy this land and give it to us as a park. We'll remember you well. But not for this. The construction mess that's going to happen here, the traffic that's going to pour in here, 500 cars a day, he says, like it's nothing. How many times in this civilized neighborhood have I chased young drivers in here and given them a talking to to slow down? You can't control what's going to happen here. We, I, don't want this. And in this country, we have a say. And if we don't want it, we're going to move against it. We fought off Fecto, who lumbered up here every few years to try to develop this area. My wife, Sue, who's now been gone, sadly, seven years, led that fight. And we stopped him. And I think we've got another opponent we've got to stop. The word I'm saying here is no, because this will seriously impact our style of life, which we are fortunate to have, but I think we deserve. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Howard. you know, can I, can I just comment? I mean, I, I appreciate, I appreciate exactly what you said, sir. Do you really? I do. You love your, you love your neighborhood. Um, then leave it alone. If we, if we look at every project that's been proposed in Montpelier, we have a housing crisis. Do people not believe that? Uh, Gabe, so just to protect everyone's time here, since you know you did get a chance to talk, well, how about we continue to go around and then that, so you that. can get the feedback that you came here to get, you know? Yeah. Go ahead. Hello, Gabe. My name is Bob Sheffman. I live at 9 Tappan Street with my wife, Beth, and we raised our kids. So we're one of those families. Yes, thank you. Referred to as downstream. Yeah. So we've been fighting this battle with the city of Montpelier almost since we moved into our home, which was 1988. And I can't tell you how many hours I spent in our basement with a press, with a sump pump, hoping every time I threw it into waste deep water that I wouldn't electrocute myself. So it's been an ongoing problem. It was a much smaller um, uh, situation that was that was um, shown to the city, and it, it passed all the state regulations, just like no. you know, your, your your partner's talking about. And, and, and ultimately, it was unsustainable. Um, there was there was talk about having a, a, a one out put on a lot. 
ultimately was unsustainable. What, what you'll do if you're successful, be it 32 or 16 or 12 or 3, you, you're going to flood out these people down here. And, and that includes our family and our friends and our neighbors. And, and, and what you're proposing is unsustainable uh, for the people down here. So, so, th so what was uh, proposed was basically a big, I guess a big pond, you know, perhaps cement line, which was going to hold the water from coming down. We, we, we've had water in our basement for, as I said, for years and years and years. Eventually we convinced the city of Montpelier to, to hire Phil Scott and Dubois to do some work. They invested about $20,000 and did a lot of work with the trail coming down here, but yet it, we still have flooding. So, so, so from our perspective, it's a death sentence that you're proposing. Sure, there needs to be uh, low-income housing, and I'm sure everybody says not here. But I would ask you, Gabe, you've been in Montpelier for five years. How would you feel if you were talking, if you were out here talking to you? And I'm sure you're a hell of a nice guy, and you'd say it's got to be somewhere. But I bet you wouldn't want to impose upon yourself what you're trying to impose upon us. And, 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 and I want to let both of you guys know. So we're, we're not going to go away. You know, we're, we're not going to say, okay, make some accommodations. We're going we're gonna to fight this to, to the bitter end. So I'm sure you're nice guys, but, but you've made enemies among some of us. And, and I'm not going to let this go. And if I lose, I lose. But we're going to do everything we possibly can legally to make sure this never happens. Not a small piece of it, not any of it. And, and so, so when you come here, I listen to both of you guys. You know, you don't know anything about it. You know where Taplin Street is? You ever been to the top of Taplin Street? No. Yeah, well, you look for, but you've but you, but you never been there. You don't know what you're talking about. And I hear you talking about cars racing in and out. How do you know? You know, you don't know. That, that, that's going to happen. If there was a road from there to here, 17-year-old boys would be going 60 miles an hour. And you can swear all day that it'll never happen. That's not true. It will. And, and, and you're going to try and make some accommodations. The accommodations won't work. We've been down this path before. We've seen the results. I spent countless hours with Tom McCarl. He was the guy for the city, going on and on and on. We've been flooded. We've dealt with insurance companies. You can't make it work. It's not going to work. For you guys, it will. And this guy's right. I mean, your altruism is, is pretty transparent. You want to make money. You're a businessman. Tom Luzon over here, he's a businessman. So he's done doing Barry, so now he's coming to Montpelier. And I see what he's did downtown. We had a great golf station, Harold's Golf. Must have been here for 50 years. Tom wanted to buy it, and he's going to put him in an apartment building. Well, he raised the, the gas station, and now we have a big empty parking lot. So, so to expect, I don't know about the rest of you people, you all sound pretty naive to me, pretty much, but to expect this to be a, a good project that's going to be good for all of us, it's not true. It'll be good for a handful of people, not for the rest of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah. You, thank you. Let's, uh, let's so, around. Yeah, so my concern, uh, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm not against uh, housing for folks. Uh, you know, I got him, Bob Shepard. Okay, Bob. I don't think we know each other. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, we will. Hello. I would like to see that before people start talking about it. I don't know what, what these lines are. And I'm in a neighborhood that they're constructing. I'm over here. This is the total Does it go to your finger right there? You see that? Everybody in the Can we show the whole group? In the meadows, we got it abutting our We'll pass it around. This is the entire, this is a parcel as it exists today. And then this is the, this is the area of the park, which is where the condo so I think we had a question from Yeah, I just, I just want to make a comment, as hasn't been talked about a lot, about the, the road through roads. My, my big concern is, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City, so I'm used to big, big I, and I don't mind personally, but I'm very, very concerned about the traffic. And without another egress and entrance, it just seems like way too much. I mean, I live on 22, which is right on that dead blind bend. And 22 Hebert. 22 Hebert. And uh, to have all this traffic coming by our place two, three, four times a day, you know, there, there are a lot of little kids that hang around here. We have dogs. And, you know, without another way out of here, I don't even see how it's safe, really. I mean, there are communities, I think, that don't even allow certain numbers of, of houses on a dead end road. So let me, I heard um, one of the gentlemen mentioned like 500. I don't know if I misspoke or you misheard me, but. That, that's kind of a threat. I mentioned that number is a threshold where you start transitioning to thinking about different road types. We're talking about 56 
units. So a little over 100. A lot of them will have two cars, right? Yeah, so, so a little over 100. Can I say one thing? I live across the street from Hebert Farm Apartments. Get a dumpster for a view out my front window. I actually counted last week how many cars went in and out of that parking lot in a two hour time period. 40 cars in and out of just those apartments. Yep. Need I say more? Hi, my name is Gene Leon. Hey, how are you good? Hi. Yeah. I appreciate this turnout. I mean, amazing. This is what it's about. I mean, dialogue and communication. I wish we had this much turnout in uh, during the elections, but I ran for council and I'm also the area, capital areas uh, neighborhood leader for Berlin Street. I live on 265 Berlin Street. Um, I, I think it's so essential to just keep this dialogue. We, we know we, we have a, a housing problem and this was an area that was developed initially to have a continuation 20, 30 years ago. And there hasn't been a development, a housing development of this proportion in over 30 years. So there is Sabins Pasture, there's Terrace Street, Northfield, there, there are other, now the city buying the golf course. So there are other potential places, but this is also an important potential prospective place that I think we should all keep an open mind and continue the dialogue and, and, if it, and the communication. And like this gentleman said, you know, it, it might be sustainable in one way, but it might be unsustainable to, to the community. I was an advocate for pushing to reduce the speed limit on Berlin Street. I don't know if you guys remember that. Yes. And our district, look, not one council member from our district's here. And our, none of the councils from our district voted to reduce it other than two others. Um, so we got 30 and not 25. Berlin Street is a community. It's a neighborhood. Bike path, walking, sidewalks, houses. It's not very rural like this. And the impact on traffic for such development is also, you know, a concern on any on all of our neighbors as well. So it's just very essential that we keep this dialogue and this communication and see what there could be a resolution to accommodate the needs of the city and housing and, of course, our community. Thank you, Dean. Barbara? Yeah, I have a question, sort of like Civics 101. You've uh, presented this as somewhat of a fait accompli, but I don't believe it is, right? Yeah. What is the process that it has to go through? And things that I'm concerned about is what the city will provide you. You said it's going to have city water and sewer. We are on uh, city water and sewer in our condo, but yet we have to pump the sewer up the hill to get to the city sewer. And it's, it is, has caused us problems. So uh, is the city going to build your road? Is it going to pave your road? Is it going to uh, do the, push the snow away on your road? What is the process and where can we intervene is what I want to know. So, so where, the, where can our voices be heard yeah, so we'll, you know, we to the city? Areas, right? so the first thing is to, to basically do the same thing that we're doing here but with the DRB. So we present what is the DRB? The Development Review Board. Thank you. So, so we present, and then they do the same thing. They give us all their comments and concerns, right? So it's all, it's all exploratory. So then we take all that back and say, okay, well, what can we do? Where do we need to make some adjustments? Um, and again, all that engineering work that needs to be done. So, and then after that, the permitting process, I don't know how many, two to three hearings probably, in the Act 250 process. So there's multiple, there's multiple gateways, right, where you have an opportunity to have some input. I think who, we should who, hear from who do Callum we talk had, to in this city? Okay. The I do you believe I'm willing to be the representative of children in this neighborhood once again. <laughs> I asked around and I found that quite a lot of the kids in this neighborhood have thought it wouldn't be safe for more cars than there are in this neighborhood to be going around. And what about our pets? Our dogs and cats that we let outside on free roam? What They could get hurt 
even just with the traffic we have today. There's no telling what could happen if we had more traffic. And there's an enormous green space. Why would we want to get rid of it? Even at this preliminary stage, do you have a thought about an alternate road? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so we're, we're really, again, trying to, to stay, uh, you know, we'll do traffic studies. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll get the recommendations of what the process is to be the safest. But, you know, again, just trying to make sure that we, you know, that we don't get into a financial problem with this development. It really was meant to be small in scope, right? So can you, wherever the map is, you know, all of a sudden, if we're trying to connect out the other side, that's a much bigger project, right? That's a much big, and disturbs much more land, right? So um, I don't know, you know, it seems where? impractical to connect out where you know, to Berlin Street or wherever. I mean, that, those are steep slopes. That, that lot, I mean, you have to. There's another lot you'd have to buy. There's no access to Berlin Road. Um, so there's a lot of, you know. So could there be someday? Yeah, there could be. I mean, I think if there were more development, that would be part of it, right? But Oops, this is really right. just trying to. Can we do this what, at all? What, what is? Right. Here we go down. Uh, the question over here. I think. Yeah. Is this all the 72? Yeah. Yes. Is this the 72? Yes. 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 So nothing here. Nothing I'm sorry, not Berlin. I meant the very much. Oh, that was the that was the original design, but that was like a 225. Yeah. You know, you think about the cost, right? If you have a lot of units, people can share costs. And so that was a 225 unit proposal, and then you know, and then you had a road that a road that went down to the very much. Thanks for the question. Um, just for your information. Yes. Three. And I'm just going out this number. Three bedrooms and two baths and $330,000. It's not downsizing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's not low income either. It's not low income. Yeah. And it seems as though you're really going for upper middle people when that's not, as I understand it, the main need, need of Montpelier. Well, there's a whole ecosystem that's needed, right? You, you need again, you need rentals, and you need the, you know the starter homes, and you need the downsizing. There's, there's, it's all needed. Can you have a variety in here, or are they all cookie cutter? Uh, so there, there, there's not a huge variety. There's there's three different styles. Uh, could there be room for something else later? I mean, you know, the interesting thing. Not later. <laughs> they all appear to have two stories with stairs yes. too, yes. which yeah. Andy so, needed. To, to try to like on the the cottage homes, right? Um, I think it does, you know, related to the speed and the teenagers, like the cottage homes do target um, an older demographic, a demographic that's used to not living in a condominium, not living in an apartment, that wants a smaller um, building that has four walls. Um, it's, you know, there's a variety of people. I'm not trying to make any generalizations, but, um, you know, the, I think the cottage homes uh, will, and the single family homes will lend itself to families and an older demographic. Um, well, but you're not going to keep you're not going to keep younger from buying it if they want to. Why would why would that be? Why would it be older people? Well, again, it's it's starter homes or people that are trying to downsize, and there are two of the models have first floor, you know, recognizing some people want that. I think it feels like you just pulled that out of the air. Why would it be just older people? You're trying to make it less it be. threatening to us because there's fewer young people driving around. I, I, I'm, all I'm trying to relay is the stuff I hear talking to But what did you base it on? All right. A lot of mar marketing material. Okay. How many handicap facility cottages will there be if it's done? Because we do have people who are in a handicap situation yeah, or disabled all, all and the, need to all have the sidewalks and the cottage will be going into the, cottage. into the cottage type thing and the sidewalk, but still the house needs to, or home needs to be handicap accessible to a person who is mobility challenged, whether like my sister-in-law, she has polio. She has to be on a scooter. She cannot walk. So, I mean, it has to be something that a handicapped person can accept and work with without having to, oh, I can't reach up there because I don't have the abilities to reach that. It needs to come down. Good stories. I think Tina had a question. So, uh, I, since we're onto this, off of the traffic and onto the building, I would wish you would consider a mix 
um, set of units. I'm not going to move from a three-bedroom house to a three-bedroom house, mm -hmm. uh, even if it is smaller. So if you're, there's been a lot of discussion in Montpelier about downsizing. People with big homes, you mentioned this, mm -hmm. uh, don't sell them because they have no place to go. I don't need my, the size of my house, but I couldn't buy another one mm -hmm. that it's a smaller size. Uh, two bedrooms, one bath, or even one bedroom house would so I wish you'd reconsider that there could be a mix and that the smaller ones could be all on one floor. If you're, if you wish to have downsizers, yeah. I think you need to consider thank, that. Thank you for that. I agree. Thank I you. Agree. Yes. yes. And I, I realize just building on that one, it could be a, a duplex with, you know, one living right. unit on the first floor and one on the second, because um, I, you still need to get enough income from the unit to make it viable. I get that. And yes. I'm the rebel of the uh, <clears throat> neighborhood, as you can tell what I came in on. <laughs> um, when uh, my husband and I first got married, we looked around for a house, and we could not find a house. We found the property. I'm at 29 Hebert Road, and we had it built. And it was perfect for just us two. And what made it special as the only place that we wanted to be was the woods area and going down and there. We have people from Berlin Street, Wheelock Street, all over that come and hike down there, bicycles, mm -hmm. snowshoes and stuff. And my husband and I, we rode, ride our bikes and stuff. We made trails for people all the way down since 1988. We made trails for people, so whatever you walked or rode or snowshoed, it could almost go all the way down to the Ford dealership. And that's the way we love it. And now, after my husband's passing, I go down there, and guess what? That's my church. That's where I go to sit and meditate and talk to the uh, upper beings and thank him for this beautiful open area that we have to live in safely. And whether I see one of the older persons just walking with a cane, not necessarily Susanna, but some of the others, uh, Gloria and stuff, walking with assistance and stuff on the street. And I'm telling you, some of those cars coming down ain't going, ain't going slow and sometimes you see them going a little bit too fast, and whoop, over the side they kind of go. So there's got to be something to uh, slow the traffic coming down. But like I say, that is always going to be the place that I go to, to meditate and enjoy the solid thing. The only thing I hear sometimes is the train coming through. And that may, brings me a good feeling saying, okay, we've got the train, but we've got everything else, and it makes me happy, and I know living there and stuff makes everybody else on the happy side that we are where we are and want to have it retain that same feeling with here and have it retain as it is here. That's just my feeling. Thank you. And, and that... That was an important part of when we laid this out. Um, out of the 70 acres, over 50 of it will remain like that. Um, I, think George, I think we're going to come back to traffic for a minute. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the last time the Fecto company proposed building back here, they proposed a road through here too. And the city ultimately would not allow it. What they asked them to do was build a switchback road down from, from River Street up into their development. And what they were going to do was put a high curb here so emergency vehicles could go over here and not have to go up the switchback. But ordinary cars couldn't, couldn't mount that curb. That's where the city was 15 years ago. And I'm disappointed that none of our councilors are here today. Gene is here and he ran for council, but he's not on the council. Yeah, I think um, that was a much bigger project. Too. It was a bigger project, no doubt about it. And, and money is a, is a problem with it. Five but o'clock might you have been a to have pretty time close. Too. Hey, what's up? Five, Five o'clock. Be respectful. Yeah. People are out of work. Be respectful. Yeah. Yeah. Be respectful. My question is about Never development mind. rights. Never mind. Um, I am no longer on the board of directors, and I speak for myself. 
But I was on the board with Howard Coffin's wife, and we at the time were fighting Recto in 2005-2007 when it was dropped. And we went to a lawyer, and we would have gone to court if we'd had to. But the lawyer had said that when the land went from Fecto, from Babcock to the Northville Savings Bank, the law was different from what it was now, and that the development rights were not conveyed during that subdivision. The, the development, the laws are treated differently now with the way the laws are now, but any rights that would have, <laughs> there were no rights conveyed to um, Mr. Fecto from the Northville Savings Bank. And, and even though he maintains that he even owns our land, he, own, he owns everything, and he's oops, going to build on our property too because he owns that property. You're talking and, about the condos. The condos, yeah. right. So I noticed on the internet that the development rights were sold separately for $250,000. And my question is, do you know for sure that there are development rights? Uh, because our lawyer, I mean, everyone has a different opinion. And also the, the head of the title at the time, um, Mr. Mark Scatina of the State Council for Lawyers Title Insurance Corporation was going to testify for us and, and say that if if there were any units built where they where the Capitol Heights was going to be, that his organization was not going to uh, ensure the tight ensure their titles because of the situation that, that he agreed and he was a lawyer that there were. I no think the assessment is what you said is that there are a lot of different opinions about that. Right. And so. But the law, the law was this changed. This doesn't have anything to do with development rights up on. No, but I thought you had to purchase the development rights from a separate. I was told that the two hundred fifty thousand dollars was paid to purchase the or development under contract, rights. contract, whatever. Yeah. To put the development rights so so you could do, do this development. So the development rights that. So, so we do have it under contract, but we didn't know all this, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So development rights that he advertised are up in here, mm -hmm. right? And after wading through all the legal stuff, we're, we're, even though it is part of the same contract that we signed, we're not proposing anything. You're not what? We're not proposing anything in here. <laughs> so what? Because it's very confusing. But the 72 acres, if that was part of the subdivision that the North Coast Savings Bank sold to Mr. Spector, the development rights referred to that piece that was part of our original condominiums, property from our declaration of condominiums. Yeah. Yeah. But not, but not this, not this parcel. This is a separate parcel. The development rights, when somebody went bankrupt, right, and then in Northfield yeah. took them, that, that related to, there's, this is where it gets really confusing and you go to the city, it's all on public record if anybody wants to read it. Mm -hmm. The Fectos wrote a letter, the city attorney wrote another letter and then the city went and recorded uh, this, this recreational the easement recreation. right here. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so that's what's on public record right now is that there's a recreational easement right there. And we're, we're not, we don't, I mean, in fact, if you were to look, you know, the idea of the walkability here is that this actually you know, exits out to where all the trails are and where that easement is. So there's so not- 250,000 was for a different piece, not for this development. No, it is for that. That's what he advertised. It is part of all the same contract, right. but um, what, whenever we get to closing, we will, we're not interested in that for all the reasons okay. you brought up. Yeah. But we didn't know that when we, you know, like it's advertised a certain way. We didn't know all that until we dug into it and mm -hmm. said, okay, this is not- Well, he so, went through so lawyer after lawyer after lawyer. And as soon as they disagreed yeah. with him, he got a new one. Yeah. And then it ended up to where he was willing to negotiate. Well, if you don't take me to court, put on your roof for you, or, you know, all this stuff to get his prep lights to go through. And it, because the market went south. Yeah. <coughs> right. Heather had a comment. Yeah, and there's one back there too. One quick thing before I make my comments. Um, you keep referring to it as a recreation easement. You may yeah. be unaware that that's a city park now. City park. Um, okay. That, yeah. that the it land, was, it was okay. land that was managed by informally, it wasn't an HOA. <coughs> Uh, after fiasco, um, and maybe I can't remember dates five years ago. It's, it's now a city park. Um, it's no longer a recreation easement. Um, but what I wanted to say, I live at 24 Isabel Circle. That's four houses up from the bottom. Um, so I've certainly been the beneficiary of the limited traffic um, that we've seen. Those woods, especially when my kids were little, were my sanity. I still very clearly remember my husband being at home and watching the kids and walking down the street and hearing the screaming and coming around the corner 
and the screaming receding, I couldn't hear the kids anymore. And I would get over the hill and into the woods, and I would forget all of those trials and tribulations of young childhood motherhood. And it was really important to me. And um, I was one of the people that helped fight off, among many, that helped fight off facto. DRB meeting after DRB meeting after DRB meeting. I have really grave concerns about, number one, the traffic. I think, I think if this, we do this, it needs sidewalks here. Hebert needs some attention. Hebert is a disaster since they narrowed it. We need deeded access to the preserved acres for the rest of the neighborhood, so it's not just under the control of this HOA to decide whether the rest of the neighborhood has it. That said, the housing crisis in this state and in central Vermont is very real. Its impact is severe, and the impact it is having on vulnerable populations, sh I won't say should, mm -hmm. does leave many people just bereft and not knowing what to do. Would I like to see this be all low-income housing? And, and, and sure, absolutely. But 36 units, and, and then also the single, it loosens the faucet. It gives space in the system for other housing to not be so crazily priced. My house is, is less than 1,200 square feet. We have one bathroom. We raised our four kids there. That house, we asked, we, were, we, want, we want to sell $320,000 to list it. It's insane. We, need, we can do something about this by not immediately shutting down a proposal. What Facto had was egregious. He, he, he just, you know, he was going to put a house on every quarter acre all the way down the hill. It was terrible. This is a cluster development. If, if, if this isn't just like the thin edge of the wedge where this gets built and then we start like expanding out. Cluster development, it saves all those woods. Yes, it's not the flat lock that we love in the field and I'm going to miss that and be heartbroken. But it preserves <laughs> that place where Trish finds her sanity over the edge. In the rocks. <laughs> where I found my sanity so for so many years. Let's not reject this out of hand and let's think about other Vermonters besides ourselves. We are housed. We are so privileged. And I'm going to stop before I do anything else. I just had a question. Is the, um, is the closing of this property contingent on you guys getting DRB zoning approval? Yes. So if it doesn't work out, you're not holding on to a million dollars worth of property? No. It's kind of nice. <laughs> Good question. Good question. Good idea. But we all have invested in significant amount of yeah. I, would, I, would, I don't know this woman's name, but I would just like to second what she has just said. Heather. I think... Heather. Heather. Uh, I think we don't want to turn away a, a proposal that is possibly preserving some of the things that the neighbors <clears throat> wish to have, such as the open space and the, and the walks and have another development developer come in a few years later that is not a good development. So, I mean, I think it's to our advantage to work together with you. you. And uh, I not just say no. I, I'm definitely not in favor of just saying no. But if we could know ahead of time with a crystal ball that these units would not address the housing oh, crisis, yes. then we would want to say no. So, you said it's too too early yeah. with fluctuating construction oh, yeah. costs and all, right. all the contingencies to say what the price point is, but our, whether we're, whether those of us who are on the liberal side want to help with the housing problem, want to say yes or no, would seem to be contingent on whether these houses really will address that problem. And if we can't know that, yeah. and you can't get any guarantees because it's impossible for you to guarantee at this point, right. then how are we supposed to know how, what position to take? I don't know if I can, I'm not an economist, <laughs> I, I don't want to pretend like I'm an economist, but every year we have a conference and the state of Vermont, they have um, an economist thing, has the kind of concluding remarks, it's the best seminar of the, of the day. And what he said it was um, pre-COVID, sorry, two and a half years ago, um, 
when we build additional units. It may not be the target that we're looking to solve, but this is close enough that it allows people to sell their house, to open up other units that are are that missing middle. Like a domino effect. It, it's, it's, a, it's a domino effect. And again, I'm, I'm, you know, that's from one seminar from an economist in the state of Vermont, um, and I'm an engineer, not an economist, but that, that's, that's what I heard. That's plausible, perhaps. Someone up on the hill. Hi, um, my name's Cassandra. I live on Green Street. I use the Green Street Bridge Street 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 Street
you got to right away and cut through the condos or something. No, so maybe you could. Uh, that ain't happening. Uh, that ain't happening. Maybe, maybe you could say something about are you guys exploring that option for a second road? Relate? Uh, no. Not Related to like this time. what Gabe previously mentioned okay, so about the all. agreements. Uh -huh. I, mean, like no, I, I mean, I think first we got to look uh, at what are all the mitigation steps unravel. because again, okay. that's. Like even if you get that right away that you talked about, sir, mm -hmm. like it's really steep. So you're, you know, that's going to be a million dollar road. Okay. And and are you ever going to recoup that money? Probably not. Well, that's for you to figure out. Well, then yeah. then we'd be selling what you guys don't want. Then we, you know, then we'd have to carve the whole thing up and put yeah. in. Well, I think that I think that that those are equally valid, right? Yeah. The, we don't want cars as much as we also want access to nature. So yeah, mm -hmm. the, for the same reasons. And I'm, I, as an engineer, I'm really interested in the concern about the traffic. Like, I, I feel like we need to make sure that's adequately addressed. Right. And, you know, I, I have young kids. They, they bike, they walk, they play, they lay down in the road. Like, they do stupid things. And, like, we need people to feel safe and we need to be safe. And we are adding additional traffic. I, I can't get around that. But what I need to make sure is that the additional traffic we're adding it doesn't make it like, you know, if one, if it's a road and five cars go down it and a kid is at night wearing black, laying in the road, like, you know, that's that's dangerous. Like the, we have to have like additional traffic, right? It doesn't necessarily make something go from <coughs> safe to unsafe. I think there's probably things that like some of those corners, some of the sight lines that are currently unsafe and they're and they'll remain unsafe. And I want to try to work with the neighborhood and understand it better and, and improve it so that, you know, regardless, like, you know, it's the same situation. I, I, I want to make things safe. So, and I know it's a cliche that like safety is the number one priority, but like as an engineer, we're overly cautious and we like things safe. I'm looking over here and uh, yes. if you happen to go over towards Forest Drive from here and stuff, there is, a, it looked like a old, uh, four types road that goes out. It's not the one that comes up behind the condos, but it does go out to either Forest Drive or uh, to um, Robin Hood Drive, I can't remember. But it is sort of like one of the old, old roads that was never really maintained. But you can tell when you go over there, there is an area and you've got your there is what used to be an old road that went over there. So I did not know and uh, if that was something that would be thinkable for an other access and that's why I had uh, invited uh, Michael uh, Philbrook from over in that area to stop by He's Montpelier PD. <laughs> I, I think we have no, I, I don't know. I told him if he came, no uniform. I we have to be careful that we're concerned about the traffic and another access would be good. But uh, thank you very much that you're not going down to 302. Right. Yes. Thank you very much you're not going somewhere else because if you think the traffic would be bad to this place just coming here, imagine what would happen if it went down over the hill or down over this hill. So. It would She's not only be the people way. that live no, here, but yeah. everybody that goes down unless you block the Sherwood Drive would now we'll come pass. down here. So we'll we want to be clear that I'm assuming just, just, just none just of these there. people yeah, want say. that. Yeah. And when we laid this out, the goal is like, it's a continuation of Isabel Circle. It's the, we want it to be the same neighborhood. And, and I get it. Like, 40 years from now, people in these houses will still refer to pe people in these houses as living in the new development, right? Like, it, it, but, but the, the, neighbor, the kids will play together, the neighbors will play together. I, 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 we really laid it out as, you know, as this, this is basically the only right of way that squares up and it was envisioned when, when your neighborhood was built to, to be a continuation of, of it. And we're trying to make a modest, small, um, expansion of houses there. Well, don't say modest, because that sounds like it's well, it, sugarcoating it. Well, 20 acres on 72. I, I yeah, feel like 20 acres on 72 is modest. Um, one thing that I think we need to address, you don't have the ability, I think, to build sidewalks on Isabel and Heber. So can, will you have an arrangement with the city that if you do this, sidewalks will be put in? And speed bumps. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think these are conversations that we need to have with the city. I mean, I think if you guys come out to meetings and you talk about that, I, I, I mean, I drove the road. I'm not sure where you'd put a sidewalk, 
but I'm not, you know, that's not my field. Uh, but there are certainly speed bumps, and we'll have sidewalks, you know, down that way. Sir, you've had your hand up for quite a while. I'm Jim Kopic, uh, new resident uh, to Huber. Right. We'll, we'll get all the traffic. <laughs> and uh, former civil engineer. Uh, the development code seems to uh, encourage or require the second entrance. Has the city given you a reading as to what, when you're required to put in the second entrance? We need, we need to, to, to work it through with, like we don't really have the frontage to, to, to make that connection. Um, <coughs> and I believe there's not a mandatory requirement, um, but as, as you know, the, the codes are dense and there's a lot of different parameters and we'll, we'll work through that with the city. Um, Okay. You found that that citation? Yeah, there's specific language about a second entrance, but I can't tell whether the city sees it as mandatory, mandatory or at the 800 feet in Cincinnati, where I did a lot of work. 800 feet was considered a long cul-de-sac, and this is much more than that. And um, so, at what point? How many dwelling units? How many feet for fire access? does the second entrance become more important? Thank you. Anybody over on that side of the street? There's somebody up behind you okay. right here. Hi, I'm Hi. Emily Bird. I live right here in 19 Isabel. Um, I'm wondering if you can help us visualize the footprint of this uh, development where the clearing will take place because I mean a lot of us know the loop over here and like how much further will it extend beyond there I'm just having trouble kind of figuring out the lay of of the impact yeah. to be able to comment I, I I do as well I mean I until it's surveyed yeah, I, let me, I, I, there's another sheet here that's in existing conditions that shows the imagery better um, let me see if I can separate these two yeah. um, why he's looking for that. Does, I like this Little cottage concept. I've okay. seen it before and it makes a nice yeah, neighborhood. Yeah. So if you just want to compare, like we have an imagery with the with all the, the units on it um, and that one. So you can compare where the clearings are to where. Um, so the clearing in the wood where we have the trails right here, how much further down do you ballpark that the clearing would extend to? Um, kind of something like, like that, or maybe a little. Okay, that's helpful just to kind of understand the extent because another concern I have is like the noise pollution from Route 302, and trees can be a buffer, I think, <coughs> and so depending on how much of the uh, tree buffer gets cleared, it could also have a pretty major impact on the neighborhood noise levels yeah. potentially. So was wondering if you looked into that or if you can comment or better yet if you have any ideas on how to minimize the extent of trees cutting down trees um, especially for the houses right along here we're interested how much of a remaining buffer there will be of the trees between the new development and the existing development to maintain privacy and disturbance during the actual activity if this goes through and environmental pollution Yep. down there. That's a great point too. Yep. They're deep lots. Um, so the ones along here, uh, there will be a lot of it that will remain. Um, as you can see, like, right, compared to, here, that's a cottage home, but, uh, you know, the, the house will be on the front half of those, of those lots. Um, it lines up a little bit with the, with the clearing. Um, but, but they're deep lots, and, and as sun gets, is, gets in there, um, five years from now, it'll, it'll be thick. Um, and then uh, all of this trees down here is, is going to remain. Um, we have VHB does have sound experts. Um, trees like it, we're not going to clear the trees, but you did comment about on sound. Um, trees are not a great um, buffer for sound anyway. So um, you're on the summer, of, even yeah. with the leaves. Uh, that's Jeff, not true. Jeff, <laughs> is that second strip of trees going to disappear? Um, that looks like that's going to be yeah, clear cut. Probably. Yep. They're going to go away. 
Yes. So you're this just is gonna, gonna have this, this is gonna stay, but that second strip is gonna go. Yes. Right. Can you help us visualize like where the the single family home ends and where the next step like is it in this open space or is it further? I guess it's it, much it was, further down. I'm having you trouble just get like, out again? Yeah. understanding how this plays out on the ground. So these right here are the single family lots that yeah. would that were back. Turn the map over. It's actually a second. <laughs> I thought that was green space. Uh, isn't it upside down? Like, no, that's not. Yeah. In. So this is a little circle, circle in that green, no, right here. You were standing right here. This is where we're at. And these are single family lots. And this will loop around to the cottage clusters down below. Where about would be where the cottage clusters start? It was the question. Mm -hmm. right, right in that second clearing. Can you put it up there so we can see, like, where is Isabel and where is the condos? You want that one? That one. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> and and we're happy to email these drawings around. Like you know, if you if you don't feel like you're comprehending it right now, um, we're, we're happy to email the, the slide deck around. Um, so everybody on the email list. From the, the top of the map. No, yeah. right under his fingers. Maybe? Yeah, yeah. So right. the very right. top center that looks like that's Isabel Road. That's Isabel. Yep. Top yeah. we're, we're standing. This is oh, there. Standing right here. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How, how deep, so like if, if our property line is the end of the lot, like how deep will it go? Because you have like a reference on the land right here of like how deep these single family lots will. So like the road's going to be on the other side of this tree line. What I'm so, thinking of. Or maybe at yeah, that. Yeah, for mine. It'll run like this. From, the pro from where we're standing here, you know, those, those lots are about 140 feet deep or more. Yeah. And, you know, the, there's the scale bar down here. Um, you know, about the length between my knuckle and the tip of my thumb is 120 feet. Can't really hear you. The, the distance between my knuckle on this drawing and the fingertip is about 120 feet. 120 feet per knuckle. So, is that <laughs> <laughs> so are yeah, they yeah, butting so up right against here. the backyards yeah. of the houses? Right I guess it would probably I end. These, these, like, uh, right, so I guess it might really help it comprehend, right? Kind of so the, the, you can see the house here, and, and between the property deep. line and the house, how deep these lots are. These lots are 50% to what, double the depth. What is this distance right here between their backyard and this line? Right here. How much? Is that the 50 foot buffer, Jeff? Uh, the, yeah, so that is. That is. The power lines, it's 25 feet from the center of the power lines to the property line that's in red right there. And that's where this tree line starts. And then it sounds like you're going to maintain this tree line for your, I mean, individual buyers, who knows what they're going to do. But for your development, you're not touching these trees. No, I mean, and there's a rear setback too. I think they're, you know, they're just as interested in not seeing you as you them. Yeah. I, that's all I got to say. Thank you. <laughs> Who is managing the single family? Like, who would be selling those lots? And will we have an opportunity to talk with them about those projects? So, anybody that would be building anything would have to get a building permit, and they'd have to go through the public process for that. How soon will you sell those individual lots? Um, you know, it's. You, you really need to get pretty far into the project before this really becomes available because they need access to, you know, all the sewer lines and connections and whatnot. So um, a little bit later, not, you know, the early stage would be put something in here and maybe have a model home where people can take a look and figure out if this is something they're interested in or not. And then, you know, to gradually expand. I mean, ideally the whole thing could be done in two years with, with workforce, maybe it takes three. It's hard to say, but, you know, obviously as soon as you could all these you want to make them available to people. Yes. Who is AA Cred who's <coughs> mentioned in the flyer? What? That's my that's my company. Oh okay. AA Cred, yeah. AA Cred. So then who's Stonewall? Uh, that's the system. that's the LLC that was formed with these other partners that we mentioned, including Tom and Karen. Thank you for being here today. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah if anyone has any questions about who I am, uh, I realize one of your neighbors who has never met me I explain to you who I am. Who are you? Why don't you let us know? Who are you? Who are you? Who Karen and I are, and how long we've been here, and how we do business. Uh, 
Uh, just get a hold of us at our home, or we'd be happy to chat after this. Can you just tell her? Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, has everyone had their questions answered? Well, well, I think this is the next question, yeah. Next question, who in hell are you? <laughs> yeah. okay. I understand pretty advanced chemistry, but what I don't understand is why you're getting all that space. Like, you say you only need a certain amount of space to That's not control the cottages, but why so much? So it's all considered one lot. So it's one parcel. So, so you, the only way that you could do something different would be to buy it and subdivide it anyway. Or the fectos, I guess, would be. I like when you buy one, you only want one water, but it comes in a case of 24. Oh. And you'd really be happy to buy one bottle, but they won't sell it to you. So I you see. have to buy the whole case. That's the way it works with this. I understand uh, the fectos Thank are not you. interested in subdividing, <laughs> well, dividing up the lot into smaller pieces. Does that answer your question? Yep. Thanks. Good. Get up here. You're 50% so high. Uh, I've met some of you. Go to Foxborough and watch the Patriots with one of you. Um, my name is Tom Lozon. This is my Karen. wife, Karen. And um, so uh, you heard a little bit about me. First of all, the lot in Montpelier. It wasn't a wonderful gas station. It was a horribly polluted site. We purchased it. We had planned on putting an office building there. We made a little bit of a bet on Montpelier that they would build a parking garage. Um, they decided not to, and that's fine, because then there was a housing crisis. First, a pandemic. Uh, so during the pandemic, most of our building crews were home. Uh, they couldn't be building. Now, uh, we've seen you know building costs. There's still horrible uh, product and supply shortages. It, the supply chain is just broken right now. It's going to fix itself, but it's going to take a little while. So we have pivoted on that lot, looking at the need for housing. Uh, our plan, uh, when we designed that building, it had to be six feet above the sidewalk um, because four feet is a FUD plane. Montpelier throws an extra two feet at it, and they ask you to put your building, your first floor, at what we call grade, uh, six feet above a flood plain. So we agreed to do that. Uh, it always occurred to me that we better warn people not to wear skirts uh, if they work on the first floor, uh, because at six feet, it was just, the building didn't present well. So what we decided to do is raise the building now that there's no parking garage, and I think you all know what parking is like in downtown Montpelier, we're actually gonna raise the building another three feet, and then we're gonna do four stories of residential apartments and we'll rent those apartments. They won't, be, they won't be condos, they'll be rentals. So that's our plan for the polluted site on State Street that we have since cleaned up. Um, you know, in terms of who we are, um, Karen's family is originally from Massachusetts. I'm one of eight kids. My dad worked for the state of Vermont. Uh, grew up in the beginning in New Jersey and then we moved to Vermont when my dad took a job in IT uh, with the state. My mom was a stay-at-home mom Mom is still with us, uh, dad is not. All of my siblings are still with us, so uh, pretty fortunate in that respect. And um, went to school at Spalding High School. Giving you my biography here. <laughs> I don't <laughs> went, think to, went to really school at, uh, wow. at Spalding, uh, did my undergrad at St. Mike's, did my graduate at Columbia, went to work for Goldman Sachs on Wall Street, and found out I had a real talent for business and vision. And uh, came back to visit mom and dad, met Karen, fell in love, she hated the city, I loved her more than I loved the city. Here we are, two kids later, uh, decided when Karen decided to be a stay-home home mom, she needed something to do. So we bought our first piece of real estate, that was 32 years ago. So how do you relate to this project? So I am an investor in this project and the reason I'm an investor is the housing crisis is real and it is affecting everything. When you're paying $125 for a plumber to come to your house, it's, be, it's partly because of the housing crisis, because people can't find a place to live. I mean, literally, we do own a lot of residential units. We haven't advertised one. When a housing unit becomes available, I usually call someone that we know. Uh, most recently, it was Central Vermont Council on Aging. Karen and I have been huge supporters of that organization. So I called them and I said, does anyone in your organization need housing? 
and their executive director said, you know, it's pretty fortunate that you're giving us a call. We just hired a young lady. She's been looking for three weeks. She was going to pass on the job. What do you have? And she looked at the apartment. The price was fair. She loved it. And uh, she took it. So that's what we've been doing with the available <laughs> housing stock that Karen and I control. Um, I absolutely agree with you, ma'am. I mean, you look at the price of housing right now, $375 a square foot to build is obscene. It was $250 a year, you know, a year ago per square foot. The price has gone up 50%, so I'm really hoping that by the time we get through permitting, if we get through permitting, you know, I realize that there are some of you here who will never be convinced, even if we decided to build two homes, you wouldn't want to see it. And I understand that. You know, I think this is a modest development, so the reason that Karen and I are involved, um, I don't intend to lose money. I mean, I never started anything um, thinking that I want to lose money, but uh, I can tell you right now, for those of you, for, for those people who are fortunate enough to know who we are, um, at this point in our lives, making money isn't, you know, isn't high on our list. Losing money, you know, not losing money is high on our list, but quite frankly, we've been blessed with a lot more than most folks will ever have. And, you know, we're interested in, in participating in great projects. We fund a lot of young entrepreneurs. Uh, we provide venture capital uh, to a lot of young entrepreneurs. So you didn't poke me once. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you got any, but, you know, when I looked at this project and when Gabe approached me, uh, I thought it was a reasonable, uh, you know, a reasonable, modest project. You know, we're not looking to propose. I'm not looking to participate in a, you know, 100 or 50 unit, you know, development. I think the scale of this is good. I think it allows, you know, our biggest issue right now is that there's no, there's no entry level housing. There are plenty of folks who, who are over 50. Uh, I, I'm 60. Karen is not. Never mind. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Karen is not. Um, so, no, and we still, you know, we still live in a pretty big house, much more than, you know, much more than we need. But there was someone who just said, well, you know, where do I go? I'd like to sell my house, but where do I go? Um, and many of you are probably at a point in your lives where if you could sort of swap homes, if you could sell your bigger home, and then buy a smaller home, perhaps a smaller home that was single level with some bedrooms upstairs. As long as it doesn't cost you more to do that, you're perfectly content to do that because you're at a point perhaps in your lives where, you know, a little quality of life and maybe a house that requires less maintenance is more important to you. And that would free up your three or four bedroom home for a family that's looking to, that's looking to relocate and, and find a job. So. Now, I'm still involved with the uh, governor's administration, still, still serve on a few state boards, was just elected, was mayor 12 years in Barrie, stepped down, uh, took a four-year break, uh, ran again for the council, not mayor, um, reason being mayor takes a lot of time, and I wasn't willing to devote you know, that kind of time. So, you know, I have a lot of energy. This afternoon, I was late because I was loading, a, I was loading an excavator the young man didn't know how to load it, uh, but they discovered some of the poles in the outfield at our little league field had fallen over, and this opening day is tomorrow, so we had to get that excavator loaded so that we can get the poles fixed. So that's where I'm going when, we're, when I'm done here to try to put the little league field back together. And so, uh, yeah, to all of you, that's who I am. Thank you, that's who we Thank are. You. And if you have any questions, let us know. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, are there any other comments people want to say? Well, everybody's here. I'll stay behind if people want to have individual conversations. What's the next step? Uh, so next step would be getting the same kind of feedback from the city that we got from you. Okay. Uh, it's called a, a sketch review. So we'll, you know, submit what we have, and we'll hear the development review board comments. And then, and then it's a lot of work to get everything ready for actual permitting. What's the date of that meeting? We haven't, we yeah. haven't filed yet. We haven't filed it. Yeah. We're, we're, we're hoping to get it in that it would be June sixth would be the next one, but we have to file by tomorrow. <laughs> so if it doesn't happen by tomorrow, then it, it would be the next one, which I'm not sure. What do you know the date of the next one? I don't know the date. No. Yeah. There will be two weeks. Ago. Hypothetically, Gabe, how, how much trouble would it be to push the buffer zone further downfield? Um, same same design, just push it maybe. Can, can we can we push it? Fifty how, yards we, down when further. We start hitting really steep. 
Are you, are you talking about like, this yeah, the buffer right zone. Yeah, yeah, the buffer zone. Yeah. If you yeah. added another 75 feet to it, let's say. How much so, trouble would that be? I, I think we could probably make it work. Um, one of the things we're at here is we're using um, light, light arc topography. Um, it, it's sketch plan, right? We want to get input, good input from you guys. We want to get good mm -hmm. input from the DRB. We need to get our survey crew out here, and, and they got to walk the ground. Like, it, we, we need better data to, to go to final. Um, so I, I hesitate to, you know, right. off I, the bat, give you one way or another. But I said you know, hypothetically. Hypothetically, it might happen. There's, that's ledge there, that first ridge. It's all ledge. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You're up against blasting. So, yes, so is there a deciding factor? You go to the city at your next meeting and they say yes or no, and if they say yes, it's done? Yeah. Or where does the deciding it's, it's factor a, it's, happen? It's all the way at the end of the whole process. So, what comes after your city meeting? So after the city meeting, we do, we do all that engineering. We go back and apply for permits. There's two permits that we have to have. One is a major site plan, and the other is for subdivision. Yeah, and they kind of we want to do them hand in hand. So, so we get uh, the cottage homes require additional permit. The subdividing land for single family homes, which the cottage homes will be one, or it actually straddles the right away, so it'll be two parcels. So there's two parallel processes. And at any point during that, someone in the city or your permit process could say, "No, you can't do it." Is that possible? Yes. Yeah, okay. I know about the and then, and then you have to go to the Act 250, and you have to clear all the environmental hurdles. Oh, yeah. and, then, and then you can come back and you get your building permit. Well, there's, you have to blast to do it. So there's many, many steps. It's a very long, very expensive process, and, and a process that invites public participation and comment. Ma'am, did you have something else? Or? No. Anybody else want to say something publicly? or? Thanks everyone for coming out. Appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to email you those letters from the developers? Do you want me to email those letters from the developers? Do you want me to email those letters from the developers?